Welcome everyone. Great to see your faces here tonight. I'm Julie Wake, the Executive Director of the Arts Foundation of Cape Cod. The Arts Foundation has been around since 1988 and our mission is to support, promote, and celebrate arts and culture on Cape Cod. We are excited for this fourth lecture um, called Modern Love Conversations on Art and Architecture. The goal of this series is to listen, look, discuss, and repeat. We want you to walk away learning something new or with a new perspective, or maybe even a new appreciation. I'd like to thank our Stand With The Art sponsor, William Ravis Real Estate, for making this lecture series possible. I'd also like to thank all of our business patrons who continue to support our work, and specifically tonight, Rogers Gray Insurance. So thank you for your support. Many of you might be new to the Arts Foundation, so I would encourage you to learn more about what we do at artsfoundation.org. And now I'm happy to introduce um, our moderator this evening, who is Lily Chan and is also a member of the Arts Foundation's Board of Directors. Uh, we are very lucky to have her as a member of the board. Lily's background is very much in the auction world. She is the former managing director of Asia with Philips, and prior to that, global managing director of the Asian Art Department with Christie's. Lily is a great supporter of the arts and today spends most of her time consulting with arts organizations as well as emerging artists on strategy, client engagement, and business development. So I would like to hand it over to Lily Chan. Welcome, Lily. Who do you have here tonight? Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. I love these chats. Um, hello, everyone online. I wish I could meet you all in person. This is a new thing for me. I've not done moderation on Zoom, but here we go. <laughs> um, thank you for joining the conversation tonight on the art of the auction. We're going to take an inside look into the auction world and also get some great tips on how you ensure and care for your collection. So I'd like to introduce our two speakers um, that's going to help us navigate this. Uh, firstly, Alice, Alice Jim Gim, who is the CEO of BitSquare since the company's launch in 2014. Before taking the helm at BitSquare, Alice was an executive team member of both First Dibs and eBay. Her years of experience in international business, and she's lived all around the world, um, in E-commerce and online auctions have been integral to building and growing BidSquare into a trusted online auction marketplace. Alice is a Fulbright Scholar, avid collector of vintage clothing and jewelry, and holds an MBA from the New York Stern School of Business. Say hello, Alice. Hi, hey, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for joining, and uh, I look forward to our panel. And uh, we also have Nilia Moore, do I see Nelia? Yes, she's over there. <laughs> Who's the fine art manager for Haven Art Group, a wholly owned subsidiary of Pure Insurance, where she partners with our sponsor, Rogers Gray. She is a licensed fine art claims adjuster and collection manager. She advises clients on fine art insurance, risk management, and best practices for the long-term enjoyment of your collections. Prior to joining Haven, Nelia spent nearly a decade as the head of the fine art department and as an auctioneer at Clark Auction in Westchester, New York. So I think we have fellow speakers that are both in New York right now. Yes, that's correct. So um, tonight I would also want to make sure that this is engaging and, and relevant to our audience who are online. Um, before we hit to the first question, if you have a moment, we would love to get to know you. You can type it into the chat. You know, let us know if you're an artist, you're an institution, you're a buyer, you're a collector, or you're just someone that wants to learn about the auction world. Um, and that will be really, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So on, um, to get us started, I 
I thought it would be great to just simply ask one question first, Alice. And, um, and BitSquare is an online auction company. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us what an auction is? <laughs> yeah, so um, auctions have been around for several hundred years. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say it's one of the earliest forms of uh, buying and selling. And very simply put, an auction is where items such as fine art or furniture items are uh, put up for bid uh, by an auction house. And the auction house's role is really to uh, solicit the what we call consignments or the items from consigners. And the auction house will appraise, catalog, and estimate the pieces, and then put those items up for an auction where anyone can bid and win on those items. So now BitSquare is an online auction though, and it's interesting. Um, tell us a bit more how it started, the story. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so BitSquare's role is a marketplace platform. So the way that we engage with auction houses is auction houses are our clients um, and they uh, list their catalogs or auctions on the BitSquare platform. And we provide the technology to run that live auction online and users are able to bid and participate in that auction no matter where it may be going on anywhere in the world and participate real time by pay placing bids online. Uh, BidSquare was started uh, about six years ago and it was um, actually um, the genesis of it was uh, six regional uh, leading regional auction houses came together uh, because they saw a need in the market to launch a platform that was really um, dedicated towards featuring trusted auction houses. Um, and they saw an opportunity in the market to do that uh, with a platform that really was built by auctioneers for auctioneers. And now we have um, over 250 clients or auction houses that use our platform today with a global a buyer base that comes from all over the world to find great auctions and great items on the BidSquare platform. You could say you were ahead of your times. <laughs> Look what's happened to the art world in the past year and a half. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, you know, um, in, in, uh, at a holistic level, if you look at uh, a lot of the online categories that have embraced online, the art and auction market is actually one of the slower verticals or categories to uh, really adopt and embrace online. Um, uh, in contrast to uh, art and auctions, I would say a category like electronics was one of the early adopters of um, of embracing online, but um, I think in, re in you know con in contrast to that, our world is has been a lot slower. But obviously, that changed in the last year, or year and a half with COVID, and so um, it's fair to say that I think um, online was the only way now that auction houses uh, and dealers were able to reach new bidders and and still continue to conduct their business. Mm -hmm. So tell us, like, how many you know. Online, you reach global people. You, your scale is amazing, right? Yeah. So it's so, like, how many sales do you have in a given day, and what do you sell? Yeah. So every month we um, are growing. Um, currently, we run about 120 auctions per month. So on any given day, there can be multiple auctions going on on BidSquare. Um, we, as you mentioned, have a global buyer base. In fact, our top lot sold on BitSquare was a yellow diamond ring that went for 381,000 to a buyer in Singapore. So, you know, this idea or notion that people wanna see and, and touch and feel the objects, that's still very prevalent, but <laughs> I would say that people um, have gotten used to buying things sight unseen through online and the comfort level and the average price points that we're seeing of items being sold online is increasing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you give us an idea of, I mean, okay, I'm gonna, uh, uh, when I first did <coughs> the auction world, mm -hmm. I had a lot of uh, pre-perceptions. Mm -hmm. um, Alice, help us to break some of the myths of auctions. 
Yeah, um, so I would say the most common myth to auctions is that it's only for um, sort of super wealthy people or that, you know, another related myth is that um, auctions are, are a place where you only buy like multi-million dollar paintings. And I would say that is uh, definitely not the case. Um, if you do a simple search on BizSquare, you'll see that there are a lot of great quality, mm -hmm. authentic items at a very broad array of price points. And so um, that's one of the reasons why I love the role that the internet has played in the art and auction market, because it has really allowed for um, uh, us to, or online players to really break open the market and make um, these auctions much more accessible to a much wider audience. And our sweet spot is really um, uh, to offer our service and platform to, uh, I would say, uh, more regional auction houses. And so we essentially are leveling the playing field for smaller auction houses to be on the same um, uh, sort of footing and uh, level playing field as the larger auction houses. So um, I love that the role that BidSquare is playing in terms of democratizing this, this, this market. Yeah. And what would you tell a seller who wants to sell an artwork and uh, the myths about selling online? Um, oh, a myth from a seller perspective. <laughs> Um, I think it's similar in the sense that the reason why I think auction houses have been slower to adopt, um, albeit with the exception of the previous year, is that, again, they, they also feel that, oh, no one's going to bid on this online. You know, like I need for people to come into the auction house. I want, they, you know, I, 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 they're, they're going to want to see this painting in person. And yes, that is still true to a certain extent, but I think the comfort level of um, and convenience and accessibility that the internet and online platforms uh, such as this square is offering um, is definitely here to stay. And bidders and buyers uh, have definitely become a lot more comfortable uh, bidding online and, um, and, and, and winning items through an auction online. And you're seeing that, um, and even during the last 12 months during COVID, especially, we've seen a lot of new bidders actually come into the auction market. So people who have never bid before at an auction, uh, we've seen a significant increase. So uh, that's a pretty exciting, um, I think, uh, movement that we've seen during the last 12 months. And, and I think that um, the whole art world has gone digital or online in the past year and a half with, with this pandemic. And it was interesting, I was looking at some statistics that in 2020, the overall art and antiques market, which is by the way, estimated around 59 billion, um, probably bigger than that because it's not accounting for independent artists that are selling their works uh, in, in multiple channels. Mm -hmm. But the overall market in 2020 uh, declined by 22%. But interestingly, the, the market that doubled was online, yeah. online buying, yeah. uh, which is now close to 12 billion. So it just speaks again to the, the reach that you could have in creating audience and people and, um, and that is accessible, is accessible. Yep. And, and granted, you know, in the last 12 months with the, with the pandemic, I mean, I think it's fair to say we were in, you know, really unique times. And so um, COVID was definitely a forcing function for um, the increase in, in online sales that we're seeing. But I definitely think that regardless of whatever was the catalyst or the trigger, um, I do think that um, we have a lot more buyers uh, participating online and I do think that it, it's, it's here to stay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Alice, I'm, I'm just, um, although we will, we will definitely have a Q&A session uh, towards the end, I'm just cognizant of some of the questions and it's relatable to our conversation right now. 
what does a person do if they want to go online, go to BitSquare, search, buy, or sell? Yeah, so um, the, the sign-up process is really easy. Um, so, um, and we um, do our best to make it really easy from a, a website perspective to understand how to participate in an online auction or a live auction. Um, so you simply just need to sign up for a BidSquare account. Registration is free. We don't charge buyers at all to participate in an auction. So you just simply need to sign up for an account, register for the auction. You'll be, then be approved to participate in that auction. And then you can either place absentee bids, what we call absentee bids, or a live bid during the live auction. Um, and so if you place an absentee bid, for whatever reason, if you're not available during the live auction, the absentee bid will be processed as a live bid during the live auction. So you actually don't even need to attend the um, live auction. You can place a bid in advance and then our system will process your bids on your behalf during the live auction. Which is a great segue because what I wanted to do is um, demystify some of the terminologies that we have in the auction world. And I think Lilia knows as well, being an auctioneer in the past, um, and every business have different terminology. So I thought we'll just do like a ping pong style okay. <laughs> um, a, a discussion where I'm going to throw at you guys some terms that we use in the auction house, but help me to give a brief def definition so people understand and provide an insider tip. Okay. Okay. I'll try my best with the tips. <laughs> Don't forget the tip. I think that's, that, that's going to be the fun bit. Okay. So the first one, which is hot on everyone's mind, Alice, what is a buyer's premium? Uh, so great question. So buyer's premium is something that's very specific to auctions. Um, this idea, uh, it's, it's an idea, it, it, it's um, basically a percentage that gets applied um, if you are the winning bidder, gets applied to the final price of the item. And typically the buyer's premium ranges anywhere from 15 to 30%. Um, the auction house sets the buyer's premium. Uh, so they decide what the premium will be. Um, and the buyer, uh, when they are invoiced for the item is provided they're the winning bidder, uh, the buyer's premium will get added to the winning bid price. So let's say you, you want an item for $1,000. Um, uh, 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 just uh, this is not a tip per se, but uh, you're not paying, you won't pay $1,000. If the buyer's premium is 25%, you'll be paying $1,250. So that's something to bear in mind if you're uh, bidding in an auction. And, and I think um, also to add the buyer's premium covers the administration cost. But, but the tip also, like you're saying, Alice, check the fine print. Yes. And most buyers premium will have a sliding scale as well. Yeah, so the higher the winning bid price, uh, it will, as, as Lily uh, has mentioned, there, there will, the buyer's premium tends to start to go down. So um, mm -hmm. it is often tiered. So if you win a million dollar piece, doesn't mean you're always gonna pay 25%. Right. Right. Now, Lilia, I love it when auctioneer says, fair warning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell us what fair warning is and give the audience a tip. Absolutely. So yeah, my, my line was always last chance and fair warning. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, fair warning in simple, simple terms means the lot is about to close. So get your bid in now. So if it's a live auction, it means if you want to bid, if, if you're eager to have it, raise your paddle, raise your hand, wave your arms, whatever you've got to do to get the auctioneer's attention um, so that your bid is registered. Or if you're bidding online, you'll probably see a prompt from something like BidSquare where you'll, you'll get a prompt that says fair warning and it's your last chance to submit your last bid. Um, now, sometimes if there are competing bids, the lot will reopen again. So keep an eye out. It doesn't mean it's definitely going to close, but just be aware of where you're willing to go up to and make sure you get your bid in in time. Absolutely. I used to tell my clients, when you hear fair, fair warning, know your top number and then just be done with it. Yeah, <laughs> right. 
<laughs> okay, another one. Um, back to Alice. What is provenance? Oh, provenance. So provenance is um, a term you'll you'll hear very often um, in the auction world. So it just simply means um, an analogy is kind of like the lineage of the piece. So uh, provenance will include uh, the history of the piece, where it was sold, um, uh, what auction house sold it, uh, the price it was sold for. So um, when they say like a piece has good provenance, oftentimes if a piece has good provenance, it can actually elevate or increase the value of that piece. Yeah. Um, so oftentimes in um, auction catalog, uh, they'll actually include a separate section of provenance in the item description. Um, and that's important information as a buyer um, that you would want to know if a piece has good provenance. Now, it's a good point because I remember that um, we used to say the three areas that that helps or determine the value of an item is one, the rarity. Mm -hmm the condition of the artwork and provenance. Where did it come from? Yep. Where did it originate from? Mm -hmm. So Nelia, on that, what is a condition report? Sure, absolutely. So a lot of auction houses, especially smaller regional auction houses, um, you know, uh, acquire consignments from estates or um, local homes. And so it's important for you to know what condition those items are in. Um, they could also come from, uh, you know, a significant provenance or a gallery or dealer. So there are a variety of places these pieces will come from, and they may come in a variety of, of conditions. So in an auction catalog, you will typically see a condition report. Sometimes it's publicized and sometimes it's not. Mm. So my tip is to ask an auction house directly um, if they have a condition report available especially if you're buying online uh, and you don't have an opportunity to see a work in person and they may be willing, they'll do a physical inspection of the object. They may take high resolution images and they'll be looking specifically for any kind of condition issues. They might be looking for prior restoration. Um, if it's an older work of art, they might be looking to see if there's any kind of cracking. So keep an eye out for that and, and know what your your turn-offs or, or turn-ons are. Sometimes people do like to have um, pieces that have an antique look. So you wanna be aware of that and know if um, any additional restoration costs might be in your future as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna ask the last term to you also, Nelia. Um, I, I know the audience is probably interested to understand what is the reserve. A reserve, absolutely. So a reserve price is the minimum price that an item will be sold at. So typically an item is offered with a range of estimate. So it may be 1,000 to 1,500 is the estimated value. And a reserve is set by the auction house and usually set by the seller. Um, they'll do it in advance of the sale, it may be at the point of consignment or it may be set just days before an auction when the interest in an item has been gauged um, based on questions that come in. So. You, sometimes an, an auction may also be unreserved, in which case there is no minimum price. Um, but typically a reserve is set at or below the low end of the estimate. So you can, you can ask an auction house ahead of time is, if an item is reserved. They may or may not reveal the reserve price, um, but it, it would be worth knowing. And you, may, um, you should be aware that you may have to pay the, the top uh, end of the low estimate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Just switching gears slightly, um, because we know the art world has changed so much. Um, yes, again, from a year and a half ago. Alice, and I, and I think a lot of people, I get this question quite a bit as well, but in this time, is it a good time to buy or sell? Um, I would say both. It's a good time to buy and sell, depending on who you are. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, kind of like the real estate market, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, you know, I, I think it's an incredible time to buy. And the reason why is because um, if you talk to an auction house, they will tell you that um, there has never been, or I shouldn't say never, but 
um, there is an incredible amount of supply that's being um, uh, uh, sold through auction houses now. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there are a few reasons for that. One is um, I think in the last year, we've seen a lot of people moving um, and also downsizing. And so um, anytime that you have that type of um, uh, dynamic, people are going to be consigning their items to an auction house. Um, secondly, uh, a lot of the museums actually have been, uh, because they haven't been able to open doors and sell tickets, they're actually trying to raise money by uh, deaccessioning like a lot of their pieces. And so I feel like it's a great time to buy because I think there's a lot of um, opportunity to find an incredible piece um, and there's a lot of um, supply in the market. Um, likewise, um, I think it's an incredible time to sell as well because as I mentioned before, there are a lot, of, a lot more buyers online and there are a lot of new buyers that have come um, uh, into auctions as a result of what's happened over the past year. So, um, you know, I would say both. I think it's a gr great time to buy. And um, as, 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 as anyone who's participated in an auction, I mean, part of it is sort of like the thrill of the hunt, right? And so you're always like searching and, you know, searching through catalogs to find that really exciting piece. Um, so it's a great time to buy because there's a lot of supply, uh, but it's a great time to sell too because there are a lot more buyers in the market as well. So... I well, think. again, it goes back to, I mean, it's doubled. I mean, it's grown so dramatically online. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, admittedly, I was getting online fatigue looking at artwork <laughs> <laughs> through every single viewing room. But having said that, um, it's just much more accessible. Instead yeah. of getting on an airplane and going to, you know, the, the 10th art fair, yeah, you can see it right there. Yeah, and and you know, I th I think the the you know the buying and selling dynamic goes hand in hand too. Like I think as people are moving more, they're selling more, but also as they're moving more, they're also buying more, right? They need they need to decorate and furnish their their homes. So, mm -hmm. um, but did you find any kind of unique finds lately? <laughs> uh, lately, um. I well, my favorite thing that I've um, purchased on well, there are a few things that I've won on Bid Square, but um, oh, and I forgot to. I'm actually in the office today. I forgot to bring it with me, but it's actually a really special um, ring by an Italian designer, um, and uh, uh, it, only seven pieces were made, and so I got the second the second edition of, out of seven and. Uh, it's a really beautiful gold ring that that uh, uh, that I won. So that's that's one item. And then uh, because I'm a, I'm sort of a vintage fashion lover, uh, there have been a few uh, vintage fashion pieces that I've also purchased uh, on Bid Square. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm going to also switch gear now because it seems that in every conversation I have about the art market these days. It inevitably goes back to this hot topic of NFTs. And um, I, I will read out a definition because, and, and full disclosure, we are not experts on the NFTs. Um, but having said that, we thought we should have a conversation around it because you just can't leave any conversation without having that topic. So I did a little research myself because I'm a, I'm a traditionalist with when it comes to the art market. But um, I looked up what NFT stands for and it's non-fungible tokens. And by definition, um, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> it's a non-fungible token previously referred to as Bitcoin 2.0. It is a unit of data stored on a digital ledger called a blockchain. And most of the FTEs are now done on the Ethereum blockchain um, that certifies a digital asset to be unique and therefore not interchangeable. So anyway, that's a lot of technical speaks, but I found this definition, which helped me. NFT is a unique token on a blockchain that represents 
or point to some other data like an image or a video. And as we can see in the art market these days, uh, the application of it is um, digital artwork, right? And there's a lot of talk about it. And what amazed me was when I looked at the numbers for NFTs in the art market, in 2018, it was valued at 41 million. Can anyone guess what is now after the first quarter of 2021? Close to 2 billion. Wow. So it's exploded. It has absolutely exploded. And oh, there's so much that we don't know, right? But what made headlines was the recent digital artwork done by Beeple whose name is Michael Winkleman, I believe. And, um, and it sold, uh, the title of this uh, digital artwork was the first 5,000 days. And it's literally images um, that he had compiled and created um, when the pandemic started. And, uh, and it sold um, at Christie's for 69 million. Okay, let's... Um, Get, get to reality. <laughs> I don't think every piece will be selling for 69 million. But what do we think about it? You know, from the NFT's perspective, what it's given an artist is authorship, okay? And um, which I think it's a great thing. And what's given this, the buyer is ownership. You know, they, it, it's sort of like the provenance that you, you, you mentioned Alice earlier. And then, you know, what do we struggle with every day in the art world? Authenticity, right? So the NFT has been able to allow three, three key elements through a set of stored data. Um, I mean, it's only been five years old. We'll see where it goes. But, you know, we'd love to hear, Alice and Amelia, what are your thoughts? I mean, Alice, what do you think of this? Is it here to stay? I think it's too early to determine whether it's here to stay. Um, yeah, I think uh, it remains to be seen. And of course, we we hear about the sixty nine million dollar you know Beeple digital image that got sold through Chris Christie's. But um, what about all the other thousands of NFTs that don't get sold for that much? So. You know, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I think it's certainly an interesting new category for the art market. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll, it, I think it remains to be seen. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that it's, it, I think it is pretty volatile and, and I agree with Alice, it's absolutely too early to know. Um, I think in some form or another, digital artworks. I mean, digital artworks have been around for many, many years. Um, so I have a feeling in one form or another, this is here to stay. I, I think the accessibility and the low barrier to entry for artists is really amazing. Um, any artist can go online and, and mint. It's called minting an NFT, um, I think for a, a pretty low price. Um, and most of the platforms that allow for works to be sold are not regulated um, like a gallery might be. So an artist can go on and post their material and it's immediately accessible to, to collectors. And a lot of these platforms also um, then require royalties to be paid if an artwork is resold to an artist. So I think the benefits that NFTs have to artists are, are, are pretty impressive. Um, and I think some of that would, would probably um, go forward at, go forward I think as we as we move with the NFT process. Um, I also think the blockchain that you mentioned, Lily, is something that's been talked about in the art world for a very long time as a way to track provenance of a piece um, and authenticity of a piece. So I think this is a way for us to actually see it actively in play with digital artworks. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of elements will be here to stay. I think it's interesting what you're saying, Lilia, with the um... The, the royalty that goes back to the to the artist. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, and, and Alice knows says, you know, being in the auction world, we're considered the secondary market. And when it's sold from one ownership to another, you can't trace, it doesn't go back. 
I mean, the, a percentage does not go back to the artist. So NFT creates this opportunity. Let's see how it's regulated over right. time, but it does create an op opportunity for living artists, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah, I think those are um, great points. And I think that um, uh, it is an opportunity for artists to um, uh, have clear ownership over their work. But I think it's also important to uh, clarify that uh, NFTs don't prevent someone from copying that piece either. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is value in actually owning the NFT for that digital um, artwork. But um, uh, I think to your point about regulation, it doesn't actually prevent someone from copying it. Um, yeah. But so I think the value is in um, sort of being able to say that you actually own the NFT to that piece, but um, anyone can actually uh, copy and download that digital art too. Right, it's essentially like a built-in certificate of authenticity. Yeah. yeah, and you're right, there's a lot of considerations and I was uh, reading, I mean, there's just so much to talk about around it, but I was saying, what do you exactly get when you buy an NFT artwork? You, you, get, you get a token. <laughs> <laughs> You get a token, and you someone a said a, a massive JPEG. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it is considerations that people should consider. If you're considering buying an NFT, you know, make sure you know what you're buying. Do you and and the copyright behind it? What can you yeah. use it for? Yeah. Is it licensable? Mm -hmm. Right. And then if you're considering to make an NFT artwork are you using the right tools are you doing it correctly are you protecting it there's loads of uh, marketplaces now that has cropped up that allows you to buy and sell but as a creator or as a buyer or a collector there's still many considerations to to be made to be made so now Lily I have you <laughs> being in the insurance area have the insurance industry even you know, said, wrap your minds around, would, how would we even ensure an NFT artwork? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I deal primarily in, in the collectibles insurance market. And, and right now, I don't think there is a product um, in collections insurance for NFTs, but there's definitely talk about insuring them the same way we would, with, you know, with cybersecurity. So mm -hmm. looking at how to protect a digital wallet and looking at online theft. Um, you know, there's also the, the classic story of uh, the guy who lost the password to his Bitcoin, you know, and, and can't recover the Bitcoin. So it's something similar to that. You know, how do you how do you protect these encrypted digital files? So I think a lot of it yet turns to online cybersecurity and, and insurance um, from that perspective, rather than a, a physical collectibles insurance policy. I think the whole industry is asking that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. The physical, tangible versus intangible. Exactly, exactly. So that's a great segue. I wanted to just make sure that we understood, Nelia, just what, what, what do we, what should we be thinking about in terms of protecting our collections? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that, you know, in simple terms, to protect your collection means to know what you have. Um, so understanding the physical objects in your collection and what type of care they need. Um, because we collect because we enjoy things. And so you wanna make sure that you're protecting the objects in your collection for future generations. So understanding, you know, if you have a photography collection um, and perhaps you, you keep it in Cape Cod and you have, you've got a lot of light coming through your windows, how are you protecting it from UV light, for instance? Um, or also thinking of, of works in Cape Cod, uh, thinking of exposures like hurricane, or flood um, or salt air, how could that corrode, especially metals if you have outdoor sculpture or even hanging hardware? Um, because we know that hanging a picture, you, it, it's hung on metal hooks, hopefully on D rings on the back of an artwork, but even hardware can corrode over time, especially when it's exposed to salt air. So thinking about all of the, the physicality of an object um, and then you know, make sure you're using art professionals if you're installing pieces, um, knowing good conservators um, and understanding how damage and loss can happen. And certainly your insurance company, your insurance broker, um, any kind of risk manager can help you get your arms around that as you start to collect pieces. Now, much like with, with BitSquare and Alice, they sell such a wide category of things that most people don't even 
imagine are auctionable. Does that apply also with with insurance, insuring objects? Like what 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 should people be thinking about? Because usually in the art world, they all think it's the paintings that I have hanging in my my you know home or in storage. Um, but what are all the categories or collectibles? Yeah, absolutely. There's a wide array, um, and a collections policy. Your your personal insurance collections policy. Well, I'm sure certainly jewelry, so not just painting and sculpture, but you have jewelry. We see a lot of wine collections. We see a lot of whiskey collections. Um, I've adjusted claims for comic book collections, sports memorabilia. Um, we even see, you know, rare uh, stones, uh, meteorites, things like that. So it can be really, really anything that you collect that has value can probably be insured in one way or another under your collections policy. Mm -hmm. um, certainly classic cars, so a wide array. So, so worth inquiring about because there, there is a broader coverage if you actually schedule an item under a collections policy versus under your homeowner's contents insurance. So, so how does one get something appraised? Yeah, absolutely. So the, you would want to uh, go to, there. there's a various, um, I, I would say maybe there's three or four professional accredited appraisal, found, uh, appraisal foundations. So there's um, the ISA, the ASA, uh, the AAA, and they're all certified appraisers who specialize in appraisals of pro physical um, property. And you would want to bring an object either directly to an appraiser or have an appraiser come to your home. And there are several different types of appraisals that you'll want to keep in mind. So if you're having um, an artwork appraised for insurance purposes, it's going to be a retail replacement value. So it's going to be the highest uh, valuation that you can generally find. Because if you were to have a fire or a big water loss and you needed to replace something, um, you're, you may have to go directly to a gallery. You may not have time to wait to get a good deal at auction, per se. Um, so you want to get a retail replacement value appraisal. Uh, if you're having things appraised for estate tax purposes, it's a fair market value appraisal, which tends to be a bit lower. Um, and that's a little bit closer to the auction market. And of course, there's nuances and subtleties to all of this. Um, a lot of appraisals can be done online now with COVID. A lot of the uh, restrictions around viewing things in person and getting a good look at condition have loosened. So sometimes things can be appraised over the desktop with really, really good images. Again, as Alice was saying, you know, we've the accessibility now um, with the internet, with everybody having iPhones or you know, smartphones to take good photos. Um, this can be done over the desktop and you'll wanna provide an appraiser with um, any kind of provenance information. So prior bills of sale, um, anything you know about the piece, uh, even if it's just been in the family for years, just mm -hmm. to give some context. Thank you, thank you. I'm just cognizant of time because I could go up forever <laughs> on these topics, but I want to give the opportunity to the people online, you know, to type into your chat any questions that you may have for Alice or Nelia, um, or just comments. Um, but I'm gonna, let me just double check. Um, Billy, I have a couple of questions that have come Oh, hey. Well, first, um, I'm curious, this is my question. We heard uh, about Alice's favorite piece that she got through auction, but I'm curious about the two of you because you both have such a strong background. What's been the craziest or most interesting thing that you've been part of in an auction? Like the item, is there a favorite piece? Is there something that you just like were blown away by? I can jump in Lily if you wanna think about it. <laughs> No, I was, I was looking at Alice too. <laughs> Go ahead, please, Nelia. So one of one of the most special auctions that I've been a part of was the sale of two landscape paintings, believe it or not, which sound pretty traditional and you know not that unexpected. Um, but they came in to us during a, a walk-in appraisal day, you know, an antiques road, roadshow style appraisal day. Um, and they were owned by a gentleman who had them for years. They were inherited from his grandparents. And um, we identified them as works by Jasper Cropsey, who is a, a second generation Hudson River School painter. And he had no idea who the works were by. They had hung in his basement next to a oh, paint by numbers that his sister had done and a dartboard. 
and they were absolutely filthy. They were covered in grime and smoke. Um, and we were able to get them authenticated and reviewed by the foundation. Um, one of them was a, a autumn scene. Uh, it was part of a four season series that had been known to exist, but had thought to been, have been lost forever. Um, and the other was a winter scene of Niagara Falls and the uh, artist's foundation had in their archives drawings um, of this landscape, but they never knew the artist produced a painting. So really special discovery. And when they eventually hit the auction block, um, they sold for a combined about 750,000. So it was wow. really, really thrilling. Yeah. And I think about it now from a risk management insurance perspective about, Did you oh my God, <laughs> you know, please know what you have in your collection. Please take care of it. Please don't hang it next to a dartboard. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I just know there's one other um, question as well. And, and this is probably, for hours is, um, do you sell antique rugs online? And how would one get it to you? <laughs> um, yes, we actually um, uh, have a few of the top um, rug, antique rug de Persian rug dealers um, uh, selling on BidSquare. So, and, and a lot of the, um, uh, uh, a lot of our sort of fine art auction houses also regularly have uh, rug, dedicated rug auctions. Um, so yes, we do sell them. Um, and how, how uh, so typically shipping is buyer arranged. Um, so um, there are some auction houses that do also handle shipping, but typically if you win uh, an item at auction, uh, you would arrange shipping um, by contacting a shipper. And there are um, quite a number of shipping companies that do uh, shipping for um, for auctions specifically. So, um, and you can, depending on the item, whether it's large or small, um, you can uh, elect to, if it's smaller, you can elect to ship at UPS or FedEx, but there are a lot of white glove uh, shipping companies that will come to the auction house. They'll create a special crate for the item and they'll make sure that um, the piece doesn't get damaged during transit. Alice, are you aware of any particular auction house that might be specializing in the antique rugs area? Oh yeah, so uh, there's one in New York City. Uh, they're, uh, they're called Nazmiel. They're one of the top antique rug auction houses. Um, uh, incidentally, Joe Biden bought from Nazmiel um, and has uh, one of their, their rugs in, in his house. So um, yeah, I would say uh, they're one of the top ones that, um, that, uh, that, that sells on BidSquare. Thank you, thank you. And I'm just looking at, um, so maybe either Alice or Nelia, what is the difference in the profile of a person that, um, that is buys online or participates online versus traditional auction. Or oh, sorry, what was what the question? What is the difference in the profile of the person that would participate oh. online auctions, buy or sell versus traditional? Are, are we seeing a difference by geography, age or uh, that gender? <laughs> question. I don't know that there's a, a significant difference. I mean, I think, I think it's more of a mindset of someone who would go to the auction house versus someone that would bid online. Mm -hmm. um, so um, obviously someone um, who's um, more comfortable just you know, uh, being online, I, I think, I think it's not sort of like, you know, age, you know, has anything to do with age or geography. I think it's more of a psychographic or a mindset and, and whether they're comfortable with uh, bidding uh, on a piece online. Because I think there are some people that still feel more comfortable going into the auction house as well. So I think it's just personal preference. Um, and now with, um, you know, with iPhones too, I mean, auction, you know, you can access auctions on your mobile phone too. I mean, it just depends on what you're comfortable with. Um, some people prefer the traditional method of doing it in person or via phone. And then you'll have some people that are totally comfortable doing it online. Yeah. I remember in my days of, uh, uh, you know, when online was emerging, it's going to show my age, but anyway, it, when online was emerging, 
we thought, oh, it's going to be such a big difference in yeah. the buyer's and seller's profile. However, we found even the, the newest to the most mature seasoned buyer or seller, they, they, they go both ways. They go cha both channels, you know, online and traditional. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, and also then you have the, the person that actually physically goes to the auction house, but okay. when they're there, they're on their phone bidding. So you yes. have that too. Exactly. Uh, they're not bidding. They're in person, but someone else is bidding for them. Exactly. That's another, that's another variation too. Exactly. exactly. Uh, and sometimes that's done just to keep a low profile, right? So they don't know yeah. you're actively raising your hand, but there you are putting in your bids and you yeah. keep an exactly. eye on what's going on in the room. Mm -hmm. the yeah, they remain anonymous. So. And um, the, the next question, I, I think it's both for both of you guys from a different perspective is, are you seeing any hot categories or items these days, um, you know, that's being sold or valued or undervalued? <laughs> the, the watch market has, oh. has seen a, a pretty significant increase, certainly with COVID. Um, I think anything small and collectible has seen an uptick. I mean, Alice can probably speak to this too as to what she's seeing coming up on the platform and um, you know, where the highest price points are, but that's what we were seeing trends of for sure um, over the last year. Yeah, I mean, just to echo that. So um, fine art is our largest category in terms of just pure sales volume, but uh, jewelry and watches is the fastest growing category yeah. from a growth rate perspective. Yeah. And it's and those um, as Nelia mentioned, um, I think smaller items uh, play a part because they're um, easier to ship. They're they're easy to buy online and also easy, very easy to ship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I learned for, a lesson learned is you know just to make sure that um, don't do your garage sale yet. Consider every item. <laughs> And yeah. see if you have a question mark, <laughs> make sure you get it appraisal valued and um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I have another question here is, Alice, can you tell us, because, um, you know, this past few years, there's been a lot and an increase in charity options. Mm -hmm. But for the everyday person who's getting into auctions, like what is the difference between charity in the traditional regular auction? Um, yeah, so in, in the past year or so, we've actually seen um, uh, 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 an increase in charity auctions come online as well. Um, and that's because a lot of the nonprofits haven't been able to hold their annual fundraising event in person. Um, and so they've been able to leverage, and, and you know, the Arts Foundation of Cape Cod is a prime example. Um, we were able to support their events online, and um, and they were still able to uh, raise raise funds for their organization. Um, I mean, I would say the main difference is uh, an auction house is simply that you know they're running auctions uh, regularly on a regular basis. Their catalogs are typically larger, um, but I've seen some great items come up through charity auctions as well. Um, and so, and, and of course, a charity auction will typically only run once, once a year. Uh, but in terms of the nuts and bolts of how the auction works, it's very, it's, it's the same as how a, a, a typical auction would work. Um, and we've also seen, I think, um, I think the flexibility of what online offers is, is nice for a charity auction. So uh, just to give you an example, our platform is able to support live auctions, a silent auction, as well as a buy now event. So a lot of the um, organizations will actually run three events online. So they'll do a live auction component uh, and then they'll do a silent or timed auction component. And then any unsold lots from the auction, they'll relist as a buy now to drive incremental sales. So um, I think that type of flexibility of really optimizing the event online um, is, is a nice, um, is a nice, um, uh, opportunity and option for charity auctions when they're considering running an event online. Thank you. That was such a nice segue for 
us to announce our <laughs> the Hodge Foundation of Cape Cod's live and silent auction. But I'm cognizant of time. We are going to wrap up, but before we wrap up, uh, there's a couple of announcements we would love to just inform you of. I want to thank, thank Alice, thank Nelia for participating. I want to thank the, the people online. Um, it's great to see the faces uh, for being engaged and participating as well. It's great questions. Um, but before we close, I'm going to hand it over to Julie just to say a few words, but thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lily, for such a good conversation. And thank you, Nelia and Alice. That was so interesting. I feel like we could do a second <laughs> discussion on this because it's there's I didn't realize how broad this topic was and some of the questions that I have uh, and Amy as well. We've been talking about, you know, what's next for the auction world. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see where it goes as the reach is broader and deeper. Um, and that's what BidSquare has brought, the partnership with BidSquare has brought the, to the Arts Foundation is we've been able to expose Cape Cod artists to beyond the Cape, over the bridge. Um, we had paintings go to Switzerland and California um, this past year. So we're really grateful for that relationship and learning more and uh, connecting with Alice. So I wanna thank all of you and, and Amelia, thank you for your expertise in that. Um, it's, it's just fascinating. There's so much information and thank you for making it seem so accessible to all of us. So um, we hope that um, you enjoyed this and we hope that you might be able to bring your new skills to our auction, as we mentioned on June 17th, called the Prelude to Summer where we will be working with BidSquare, the BidSquare team to kick off another Arts Foundation art auction. And we'll send you the details tomorrow in, a, in a, um, an email, follow-up email. Our live auction will be Thursday, June 17th. Uh, and we will be filming it. Uh, we will actually be broadcasting it live from the Hyannis Port Club here on Cape Cod. And then we also have a silent auction and that will start June 3rd and go through June 20th. Um, so we hope that um, you can use your new skills. And that's about it from the Arts Foundation. So we really appreciate all of your time and thank you for joining us this evening. And I hope you can enjoy the last uh, hour of sun. Maybe we'll have a sunset here on Cape Cod tonight, finally, finally this week. So thanks everyone and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you for having us.